Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. I have Dax Cook with me today. He's the founder of Farmfolio. And he has always had big ideas and lofty goals. After graduating from University of Alabama, Dax entered the world, wide world of financial services where he successfully founded and exited multiple startups. Uh, in 2014, after spending a decade in the financial services industry and co-founding Inc. 500 fintech company, Dax moved to Panama City, Panama, uh, where he developed a passion for agriculture, and that's where the farm folio concept was born. Dax, can you give us uh, more idea about what you are up to nowadays? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Alpesh. It's great to be with you. Uh, hello to everybody in the states. Um, I, um, you know, as you mentioned, we started Farmfolio with the idea to, uh, to develop agriculture and make it accessible as an investment, uh, you know, throughout the supply chain in agriculture to anybody. And uh, over the last five years, we've been doing that. Uh, we've been developing farm properties, packing facilities, uh, distribution channels in the U.S., Europe, and, and also India, as you and I were just chatting about. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, things have been, you know, it's, it's been a blur. Things have been moving really fast, but, um, you know, we're getting to critical mass now, and a lot of people, especially now with COVID, are really starting to um, look for other alternative assets. Um, you know, we've raised a little over $15.5 million into our five projects um, we're based in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, we do project developments in Colombia, Panama, uh, soon to be Peru as well. And we're continuing to, uh, to open new opportunities. Um, you know, pretty much every three to four months, we, we typically have something coming out. But um, a lot of stuff going on. I could talk for days. But uh, just that's the, hot, that's, that's the 10,000 foot view. That's awesome. And, and, and we chatted about India because it's, it's very rare. Of course, uh, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen and I, I love this country, but I grew up in India. And it's very rare that I find someone who, visit, who has visited my place uh, because I come from western part of India. Yep. Most of the IT engineers in, in Silicon Valley and they come from southern part of India. Yep. So, yes, it was interesting. I was great and, to be the home of Gandhi. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, uh, my home, my uh, home, uh, you know, um, is literally a mile from Sabarmati Ashram, which is where, you know, Gandhi resided. Um, so, no, that's awesome. And, and agriculture is near and dear to my heart uh, because I'm a vegan. Yep. Right. And I turned vegan about seven years ago. Before then, of course, I was a vegetarian, too. Um, and I have personally invested in agriculture uh, in Panama, as well as Paraguay and Belize in from coffee farm to orange tree farm uh, and, and chocolate farm. So I don't think chocolates, coffee, um, orange tree uh, are going away because uh, we Americans, we can't live without coffee, chocolate and uh, orange juice. Right. <laughs> The essentials. Yeah. yeah, these are the essentials. And, and now that um, another thing I was reading recently, because of COVID, people are realizing that, you know, agriculture is the most important asset right now, overall, even in, for your well-being. Uh, another thing I found out is that people are now moving away from meat. That's because right. you saw Tyson Foods had uh, some issue at their meat processing plant and whatnot. Beyond and, Beyond yes. Meat up uh, 44 percent in five days yeah i believe you i love beyond meat <laughs> so and another thing i noticed that the number one selling item uh, from on the food side not not counting the toilet paper and paper towel <laughs> was avocado can you believe that it yes. beat every type of meat and everything and and i was telling my wife why did you pay almost double the price of avocado at costco and then i read this news I'm like, okay, it makes sense because Mexico, you know, also had coronavirus issues and they had to uh, reduce the supply. But of course, you know, when the, sure. the demand was already going through the roof. Yeah. So um, again, I don't want to go on a tangent, but I just want to highlight well, why well, agriculture is important. <laughs> absolutely. And, and we've seen that over the last, you know, 60 days. This is, a, this is obviously, you know, a first time occurrence for anybody in our generation to yes like this and uh, you know we're very strong in the distribution end of our business we have a a sales desk where we distribute all of our own fruit that we grow in Europe we're um, we're actually distributing in 13 countries uh, on the European continent as well as Dubai and I can tell you you know we're 
we're focused right now. Our, our biggest business in sales is pineapple. We have a pineapple farm in Panama. Oh yeah. And um, you know, pineapple prices, container prices have uh, increased about 30%. Wow. COVID. So we've actually seen an increase in pineapple prices and uh, air freight fruit has increased from about $2 and 20, excuse me, two euros and 20 cents per kilo to three euros and 30 cents uh, per yep. kilo. We've seen both ends going up. We're now selling avocados from Peru as well. Oh, uh, nice. You know, a box of avocados. I, I love them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I it's great. I mean, it's, and, and we're getting into limes as well. So uh, we should nice. two weeks ago. So yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a fundamental part of society, regardless of what's going on in the world. And that was really one of the basis is I came from the investment space. So, right. um, you know, really having a hard asset that pays a dividend was something that we were really looking to create that would perform in really all market conditions. So, uh, and the topic today I want to chat about, because before we were discussing is diversifying your port portfolio in into agriculture business. What do you mean by that? So I come from real estate world and, and before then IT, right? And I invest heavily in real estate. And uh, even though agriculture is kind of real estate, but it's a separate industry, right? So yeah, well, what do you mean by diversifying? Yeah, well, you're looking at in traditional real estate, you know, multi, whether you're in multifamily or development real estate, you know, you're, you're, you're banking on tenants. Uh, our tenants are, are our fruits and th those are sold in the market. So you've got true diversification uh, in, the, in the demand cycles based on you know, who, what your actual yield is going to come from. You know? And you know, the, the valuation metrics are the same. You know, real estate is typically valued on net present value because it's a cash flow based investment. Right. Agriculture is the same. And where we see the major opportunity in the underdevelopment, especially in emerging markets, is the cost of land here is lower. The cost of operation here, labor costs are much lower. And we're developing, for instance, in Colombia, in a peso-based economy. And we're exporting to dollar and euro-based economies. So there's a huge margin when you look at, you know, not only the yield, but if you look at the valuational increase, if you buy a raw piece of land in, in agriculture, you know, it's worth X. But when you put those trees on top of it, once those trees start to cash flow, that's a net present value calculation. I mean, in our first project was a coconut farm, a 230 hectare coconut okay. farm. We spent about $5 million on the full development of that. That's land purchase, development costs, okay. care for four years we our initial investors were putting in a minimum of twenty five thousand. dollars today mm -hmm. the net present value of the project on our latest valuation that we just sent out in march is over a hundred thousand dollars a unit um, so you're looking at a 4x increase in a four-year period of time because we bought inexpensive land we had inexpensive carrying costs and now we're using the net present value formula on evaluating the future cash flow of those trees. Uh, okay. And that's really, on, it's only on a 10 year basis. So, uh, so, so in real estate world, I use net operating income, NOI, uh, yep. and, and cap rate to come right. up with the price I wanna pay or, or you know, a realistic value. So when you say net present, present value, is there a formula around it? How do you come up yeah. with that number? Exactly, so what we do is we, net present value is a formula. You know, you have, you have a series of cash flow and you're discounting the future value of that cash flow. So the further you go out, you're discounting year by year at a specified discount rate. We use anywhere between a 10 and 12% discount rate per year on the future cash flow for every year. So when you run that backwards, you're not taking the actual cash value as your valuation. You're taking the cash value minus the discounted percentage every year. And that's a pretty common formula in cash flow based investments. So, um, no, that, that's great. So just the example you gave about the co coconut farm, how did you come up with a value from 25 grand to hundred grand or whatever it is, it's from five grand, uh, 5 million to 20 million yeah, now. If you take the number of units that we had in that project, uh, 206 units and divide that out, right? Per a per unit basis, the total investment was $5 million and the valuation is, is over 20 now. So, and, and the total project. So I'm just giving you a per unit, right. based, but the total project uh, has now come over that. So we took our projected cash flows on the project, 
Now we're using documented um, harvest rates. You know, a coconut tree, you plant 175 trees per hectare, uh, which okay. is the measurement of land here. Right. And you average anywhere between 130 and 150 hectares, excuse me, 100, 150 to 175 uh, coconuts per tree. Each coconut is valued at 50 cents um, you know, per coconut in the local market here. And um, we're able to, you know, we're able to sell that locally for that rate, uh, as well as uh, if we're exporting, you know, there's a significant value add to that. We could be 80 cents to a dollar if we're selling in our European distribution market. So, you know, we've been conservative. We're only using a 50 cent rate uh, on our cash flow valuation. And we're using a 10 year window of time. So we're forward looking 10 years. Now, a coconut tree has a lifespan, depending upon the variety of anywhere between 50 and 70 years. So we're only looking at a 10 year window of time. We're not even counting the cash flows beyond that. Oh, so, I see. Yeah, it's a conservative estimate on that. But all of our projects are pretty much valued in that manner uh, on the net present value. And it's based on real rates in the market. And I don't mean the retail rates of fruit. A lot of people will try to value right. agriculture, what you're paying. Yeah, no. That's not what you <laughs> Okay. So you end up, you know, everybody who touches that fruit typically makes between 10. Right. And 10 of course. Right? So that's it's the, the cycle, right? That's the economic right. cycle. Right. Otherwise, <laughs> right. It's the supply chain. Now that's yeah. the benefit of what we're doing because we have integrated. We're not just growing farms. We've constructed packing facilities. We've constructed an import office in the Netherlands that's distributing fruit. So we've skipped two steps in the process. So our fruit goes from our farm to our packing house to our distribution center in, in the Netherlands and is sold directly in a pallet size order to a customer, either a retailer or a wholesaler throughout the 13 countries in which we're distributing. Wow. So that, that means you are able to control some costs. Not Absolutely. all the costs, but yeah, no, that, that's pretty it's, interesting. It's diversification too. I mean, when you look at, we're distributing in 13 countries, but we have probably 45 customers that buy two to three pallets. Well, if you were just relying on an importer to buy all of your fruit in a time like COVID. Oh, <laughs> you'll be in trouble, right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and we, when we were chatting earlier as well, you mentioned this is an essential business, so you are allowed to stay open. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, country by country, you know, governments all over the world have, have really dictated who's essential. I mean, right. agriculture pretty much anywhere you go has been deemed essential uh, at this point. Colombia, uh, where our operations are, Panama as well, we've had no slowdown in our fruit related businesses. Um, we're also in the timber business. We have a, a teak processing facility in, in Monteria, Colombia. We had a 10 day um, shutdown because we had to uh, order all the new materials. We had to get um, you know, N95 masks for our employees. We had to get hands. Right. As soon as we had all of the, all the required materials, we were, able, we were able to go back after a 10 day break. But we're still on actual lockdown here in Colombia for non-essential businesses, but we've been operating, you know, virtually without any interruption. So did you see any impact uh, to your business because of COVID-19? The only, the only segment of our business that's been interrupted is our air freight business. Ah, yes. We ship, uh, we're actually the number one exporter of air pineapple from Panama to Europe. Really? And yeah, we are. We, we, we wow. launched that initiative last year and through our LaDonna brand, we've been able to build that. And uh, we do about 90 to 100 pallets of fruit per week in air. And we use KLM, we use Air, air Europa. Okay. Now, those airlines shut down virtually all of their flights. Um, so humanitarian flights were still flying with right. KLM. And we've been able to get some volume onto those flights. Um, but we've had to shift to DHL uh, and cargo carriers who are still operating at normal, um, normal routes, but their cost is a little bit more. So I would say mm -hmm. we've had a more expensive air freight cost and uh, we haven't been able to ship as much volume as we like, but our sea container business has had no problem. The ports are still running, Panama Canal is still running, uh, yes. going back and forth nonstop. So, I mean, small impacts. 
but you know, nothing compared to what you know the rest of the world. Right, right. Yeah, and, and I was talking to my wife about it. I said, you know, thank God we have a job, we have work, we get income. Right. I see uh, one of my kids' favorite restaurants uh, here, Sweet Tomatoes. I don't know if you heard oh, about that. Yeah. They're they're closing down. Yeah. A so lot that, that a lot that's people, huge. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when I got into this business, this is, I mean, this is kind of the moment that you were preparing for, but you never actually thought right. it would be something like this. You know, I mean, we, we thought maybe recessions would come and agriculture would be the stability, but a complete global shutdown is something that nobody's ever no seen. One, yeah. Yeah. Ever. This is, you know, the last something like this happened was in 1918, 1919, yeah. Spanish yeah. flu. Yeah. And so it's, it's like a hundred years phenomenon, phenomenon, right? No one has seen this before. So but, you don't know what to do, right? That's but right. You, you mentioned some of the expenses increase, like even buying the N95 masks, hand sanitizers, did that affect any of the business operation because air freight expense or any of those? Yeah, I mean, we've been able to pass the majority of the cost on, you know, from an air freight perspective, our largest customers uh, for air freight purchases are in Paris and Milan. Okay. And they've passed the cost on to their customer. Our margin has been unchanged. Okay. So we have a set price, like, you know, we're, we're anywhere between, you know, $10 and $12 per box, but the air freight costs $20 a box. Right. Um, so, you know, the, the customers understand what's going on and, and um, they're absorbing the cost. And I think that will continue because, you know, the growers will just stop shipping if, um, if the cost, we would just move to sea container and, uh, and avoid the airlines if it got too expensive. Right. And, um, how do you compare the agriculture business to, you know, stock market or real estate market? Is this business tied anyway to Wall Street? Like anything happens, let's say in China or UK or Russia, the US stock market corrects, right? Goes down or up, right? They are very uh, correlated. So is agriculture any, any way related? Well, I think the, the answer is depends on what segment of agriculture, what commodity you're talking about. If okay. you're in a publicly traded commodity like grain, <laughs> futures, right. futures, you know, yeah, you're going to yeah. see, impact. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know, and when we got into this, our focus was on niche products. It was not, you know, non publicly traded. We don't do anything. I mean, pineapple is as close to, we're going to get to a traditional commodity business. Right. And uh, even within that space, we're, we're really in a premium space that's not commoditized like your Del Monte fruits. We, we sell at a premium. But, um, you know, I think, uh, I think you will see some effects. I mean, I know a lot of the U.S. farm business has been highly affected, you know, even before this with the trade relations going on in China. Right. Um, but, you know, it really just depends. I mean, the flower growers, um, you know, around here, which is a, a non-agriculture, Colombia is one of the largest exporters. They've had problems because they don't have access to the air route. The air routes uh. are there. So, um, you know, I think it depends. I mean, that's, that's part of the risk analysis that we make before we go into a project or into a category. And so far, you know, we've been able to, um, you know, validate our theories of, of the products that we're working. I mean, would you know, the teak business was one that we didn't know really how that was going to go. And, um, you know, as we were talking about, India is the largest consumer of teak yes, in the world, in 70%. Right. And, um, you know, we were getting cash payments from customers uh, yeah. during COVID. We got, I mean, $100,000 orders. And, um, you know, we were normally working on a letter of credit. And, you know, which means that you, you basically, you get a guarantee from a bank before you export and you have a certain amount of time to, uh, to claim that. But we, you know, we, we made the decision given the situation that we had to go off all credit cycles because we didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> right. System. So we said, look, we can't ship without cash payment. And, you know, luckily we had already laid the foundation in India and the customers knew us. We had been shipping to them for a while, so there was no problem. Yeah, and uh, I think that's a great decision because as you can tell now, credit market is getting tightened, right? Um, yeah. You know, some of the properties we were supposed to close, the lenders have backed out and, you know, we are yeah. now going through another yeah, we lender. Went from, we went from a 45-day credit line with the airlines to seven days. Whoa. Yeah. yeah, big change. Yeah, huge, huge. So 
how did you build this business from scratch? I'm just trying to figure out how, why did you pick agriculture? What made you choose agriculture? And then the very first product you went with, be it coconut or pineapple, how did you come up with that idea? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, when I, 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 as you mentioned in my bio, I sold a company in the U.S. I was in the financial services business, fintech related company working Mm -hmm. in space. And I exited that. I moved to Panama actually to help my father retire. Uh, He had been retiring in Panama for years. And I I ended up moving down there before he did. And, um, you know, I was living with a group of guys who were sourcing produce for Whole Foods and Costco. They were my neighbors in my apartment. Yeah. And, uh, so they asked me, they walked next door and asked me to put together a financial model for, um, for a farm in Panama to help them raise capital. So, you know, I took a look at the model and it was a mango farm. And, you know, I looked at the model and I said, Are, these numbers can't be right. I mean, the margins were too big and uh, I didn't <laughs> have thought of agriculture as something that would be profitable. And I was actually in Panama looking for real estate. Uh, that was part of the reason that I moved down there. I was going to go into, uh, you know, somewhat of a, that was right when Airbnb was really kicking up and we were going to, a group of guys were going to get together and buy packages of condos, renting them out. Panama was mm-hmm. growing like yep. crazy. Time. So um, I immediately saw this opportunity and I started looking for ways to invest and I couldn't find, I couldn't find any public companies that were directly invested in the farms themselves. You know, you've got input companies like John Deere and Monsanto and, mm-hmm. you know, companies yep. that the inputs but the actual farm and the access to the supply chain there was no instrument that i could find to access it so i said look that is the opportunity let's create access for people in these operations so i literally for about a year went all over the place all over south america all over central america i mean i visited farm after farm after farm after farm really just studying different products understanding the terminology where the risks and um, 2015, I decided that I was going to start a company, Farmfolio. Uh, originally, I was going to start in Panama, and the Colombian government called me, and they, they knew what I was doing, and they said, we want you to come start in Panama, or excuse me, in Colombia. So they set me up in an incubator in Medellin, uh, by the oh, name really? of which is a tech incubator. And we always saw this as, as a fintech business uh, from the beginning, because we're creating this digital you know, way to invest in, in farms. And, um, so we started here, we started with the coconut farm. We chose coconuts because a very close advisor to me actually based in San Francisco, Greg Holtzman, who runs uh, Pacific organics and Pacific fruits, which was actually acquired last year. But, uh, anyway, he, I said, where should we start, Greg? What's the best product to start with? He goes, he goes, start with coconut. I said, why? He goes, cause you can't screw it up. And, uh, <laughs> there's different things you can do with it. And it grows anywhere, and nobody's really figured out how to develop export quality plantations in Central and South America. They buy everything from Asia. They would right. rather buy Central America. And, um, you know, from a shelf life standpoint, especially in the fresh coconut oh, world, yes. you know, direct access to the U.S. and coconut is, is still growing year by year. I mean, it's almost a $2 billion industry now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, we, we chose that, we developed that farm, and we were really hands-on. I mean, I moved down to Monteria temporarily, was really involved, got our education. I mean, we walked a mile with this project. We were sleeping at the farm, really involved in every aspect of the development so that we could build the foundation for what we were going to do going forward. And, you know, every project that we've done, we went from coconut to pineapple uh, to timber, and now we're into limes, and we're going into avocados as well. Every project that we've done has been, you know, really the knowledge base just gets multiplied exponentially as you go forward. And what we've done with the distribution channel now, I mean, we have a four-man team, man and woman team in, in Europe, um, and we're intimately involved in the sales process. We're working with customers to, to ask them, what should we be developing now in order to bring to you in the market? What are you short of? What, what, are, what are the problems? And we're getting a market perspective now. So we're getting commitments on fruit that we haven't even grown yet. And, um, you know, those are long-term relationships. And eventually we will get into that space as well, into the wholesale markets. But, um, you know, we've really laid the foundation to – create an entirely new asset class here. And agriculture is not a new asset class, but the way we're doing right. it is a new asset class. 
So I think that's what we've created. Hey, so another question I have, and I invest in agriculture, so I understand, but for my listeners, what are the risks, right? For any investment, because, you know, uh, as you mentioned, this is a fine fintech business for you and, you know, investors who are buying into these farms or whatnot, what are the risks? Yeah, I mean, you know, just starting with the obvious risk, you've got climate risks in projects. I mean, you've got, it depends on what you're growing, where you're growing it. Uh, you've got drought effects, um, you've got, you know, all, depends on where you are again. I mean, you can have any kind of weather effect or, or disease or something like that. So, I mean, you really need to be working with an experienced grower uh, and somebody who has operations. Our team, the people that we bring into projects have 10 plus years experience in whatever product discipline that they're growing, you know, whether it's lime or or coconut or avocado, we're bringing experts. We're not, I mean, we, we know a lot about agriculture now, but we're not agriculture, we're not agronomists. And um, right. we depend on teams. We actually just made an acquisition in the last two weeks, believe it or not, during COVID. Uh, for a farm management group here, Invex Agro, which is going to serve as our exclusive farm management company uh, for the development of lime and, ag and, um, and avocado. But you know the financial risk. You have market risk as well. I mean, if you're if you're in a product um, that you know you've got huge volumes of competition during certain windows. Like for instance, if you're looking at the lime business, which is a great example, Brazil and Mexico are the two largest producers. Right. So if you don't have an established distribution channel and your product comes to market, if you're growing limes, it's coming to market in the same window as Mexico and Brazil, and you try to s start exporting at that time without really <laughs> understanding the market, you're gonna get crushed. No one's, I mean, you just, you've got to, we spent three years going to fruit shows in Europe at Fruit Logistica in Berlin, Fruit Attraction in Madrid, developing those relationships. So you gotta be really tight on your numbers, and you gotta have a, an absolute to the, any understanding of the cost of inland transportation, exporting, shipping costs, import costs, inland distribution at your destination, cold storage, all that type of stuff. Um, and you know, that stuff can change and you have to be on top of it. So I think those are the main risks. Um, you know, you've got counterparty risk with whoever you're dealing with. You better be right. very comfortable and somebody should have a, an established track record of success. Um, you know, a lot of people took a chance on us in the beginning, um, you know, not coming from this space, you know, mainly raised money from friends and family when we started. And, um, you know, now we've raised, you know, we first two and a half million was pretty much friends and family. And since then, everything else has somewhat been crowdfunding. And um, we have uh, had a lot of success. We have a lot of very pleased investors. And we probably, I would say on every project that we've launched, we have about a 40 to 50% reinvestment rate from our existing in, uh, investor base. So I think that kind of speaks to what people are, are experiencing with what we're doing. And, um, but you know, for, for other people out there looking at evaluating operators, really study what their track record is in sales. It's one thing to develop and have an idea, but where are they going to sell the product? What is their track record on that? And what is their plan? Because to me, I think the market risk of distribution is the largest risk. If you're, I mean, you can, you can kind of map out the climate risk and make sure you minimize that with irrigation and things. But uh, the market risk and the sales challenge is something you really have to be prepared for. And uh, if, you're not, if you're not working with somebody who has that experience, they need to have a plan and, and really demonstrate that they can do that. So um, how do you ensure against... Um... Uh, mainly the diseases. Is there any insurance? Yeah, you can insure crops. Um, you know, there's crop insurance depending upon what you're in. Um, you know, you can get cattle insurance, you can get crop insurance. I mean, just again, it depends on where you want, what you're in, where you're developing. Um, I mean, you can, you can virtually insure any of it. The question is, what is the cost and um, how is that going to affect your, you know, your project? Um, we've, we've not insured, uh, our crop-based projects, we haven't had real issues. Uh, we weren't overly concerned. For instance, like our coconut plantation, we have a um, Malayan dwarf variety tree, which is resistant 
to uh, the, the most common coconut disease, which is yellowing uh, that occurs in Mexico that really affects the tall trees that you see. We're a, we're a hybrid tree that's a combination of a, a tall and a dwarf. So we, we made the decision we didn't really need to do that. Uh, we have a very good maintenance and operation team uh, that control any other risk. You know, the main risk in coconut would be beetle or something like that. But, um, you know, we just, we didn't see the need to it there. Pineapple is a short-term crop. It's a 12-month rotational cycle. Can't afford to really insure pineapple due to the margins. And, um, you know, with lime, we're in a packing facility, so we're not actually owning the farms at this point. Oh, I see. So we don't really need uh, to, I mean, we, are, we would insure the packing facility, but we have, you know, production guarantees and other things on the machinery like that. But, um, you know, it just depends. I mean, I think if you're in, if you're in um, uh, developed markets, the, the expense is a lot less. You know, if you're in California, it's a lot cheaper to insure your crops than it is here. I mean, there's just different risk factors. Right. But, um, you know, we feel pretty comfortable with our risk level and uh, people understand that and, and we haven't had a problem with it. So what is your, uh, what is the current deal you are working on? So we've got two open projects right now that we're closing out. Uh, they actually may be closed out, but uh, yesterday we had a webinar and I'm happy to get you a copy of that as well that really goes into the deep dive of, uh, what we're doing, but Valle Verde and Buroteca are two open projects. Valle Verde is a uh, 1,300 square meter uh, lime packing facility, really the first of its kind, state-of-the-art facility. Uh, we brought in a, uh, a Mexican packing line from Uruapan, Mexico. We're importing to pack at volume for Tahiti lime. Uh, we've got an agronomical program with that. We've got 28 farms. It's a little over a thousand hectares of uh, lime that we're going to be packing and exporting and selling through our distribution channel. Um, we're raising two and a half million on that project. We had, as of yesterday, we had 650,000 left, but I think we're about out closed on that with a minimum investment of 50 K. And, um, you know, the average, the projected yield on the project is 12 to 15%. Um, very conservative estimate that's based on really only operating the facility for eight months out of the year. Um, due to the harvest, but we do believe that it will be year round. So I think that's going to probably edge up closer to 20 to 22% when we really get into it. Uh, and then our second project is Broteca. This is a facility that was uh, finished in August of last year. We're doing a second round of capital raise to expand this operation. It's a teak processing facility located in Monteria. Uh, we export uh, about 25 containers a month of sawn teak wood, primarily to India. Uh, we're starting to export to Europe as well for finished projects in deck tiles and flooring. Um, and, and this is a phenomenal project. You know, it's, it's in that agriculture space, but it's in timber and uh, it's part of the supply chain. There's about 65,000 hectares of planted teak in Colombia that's ready for harvest. And there, there is no transformation facility. So, it's a lot cheaper to send processed wood from Colombia to India versus sending round logs because of the waste factor. About 50% of a tree is lost in production. Um, the bark, the sap wood, the, the part that's really not valuable. And transforming it here versus waiting until it gets to India saves about 50% on the transportation cost. So, Phenomenal opportunity. It's a great growth story. We're working on vertically integrating this as well. We're getting close to a deal with acquiring an extraction company and we'll actually start buying standing timber as well in the future. So this project's got a 12 and a half percent yield. Um, it's a five year buyback. So we're offering a five year investment with a redemption at the end of the five year period and a uh, great opportunity for people looking for Solid cash flow. Uh, again, this is already an operating business and uh, has a, a, a robust facility. And, you know, it's good for real estate based people who are looking for uh, potentially even a little uh, valuational increase during that time period if they want to try to exit. Oh, that is great. And of course, you know, I'll take a look at the webinar as well. And if sure. anyone is interested, um, would you be changing any business or investment strategy after coronavirus? pandemic is over. Yeah, right now we're, we're really stepping on the gas. Um, you know, for us, we've had 
I think there's going to be a lot more attention on the agriculture space from an investment standpoint. We've gotten contacted recently um, by private equity groups, family offices that are looking for access. I mean, we're, you know, in the, in the space, if you start researching agriculture investment, we get a lot of SEO because we write a lot of content. So we've got people reaching out to us all the time about, you know, how can I get involved? Do you got, can you guys manage projects? So, you know, we're really making an effort to create a very robust um, farm management program so that you know we can actually contract manage and sell fruit and commercialize for people so we're starting to build out our our farming as a service business if you will uh, where people can put their own land up we'll develop it we'll manage it and we'll sell the fruit and they can hold the title so we're working on a, a couple of new things that are going to be coming out soon that's probably one of the biggest changes that we're making to our model um, we'll still continue doing uh, private equity style projects where we create the deal and we do everything but I think farming as a service is going to grow very quickly with people wanting the uh, the underlying land holding and, and holding the title to the property themselves and uh, just hiring us as, a, as an operator of the project. Okay, no, this was great. So let's take a quick break and after the break we will go through our lightning round. All right. Welcome back to Wealth Matters Podcast. Um, Dex, are you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. What is your favorite real estate or finance or any uh, personal development book? Um, probably my, one of my favorite books is Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Oh, I, yes. Uh, I'm a big fan of that whole group, Peter Thiel, um, Elon Musk. I, you know, I like to read a lot of autobiographies. I love Elon Musk's book. I like reading about stories, success stories gives me a lot of motivation. So, uh, but I would say, you know, business related book of, you know, how to create value would be zero to one. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a great book actually. Is there anything, did you do anything in team with your business uh, to, to improve your business in the last three, four months or any tool or tips you want to share with my listeners? Yeah, we, we were, uh, my operations manager, who I think, you know, uh, Oscar Baracaldo. I mean, yes, he really, um, was, was very instrumental in, in taking us digital three years ago with everything that we did. Um, you know, we've, we've been working virtually, we have teams all over the world. So we've been working on, you know, Zoom and, and Google Hangout meeting style. Uh, right. So we have an office here, but you know, we, we really go in there just to do group meetings or maybe once a week anyway. So um, I wouldn't say that we've made any major changes um, in the last couple of months because we were a little bit ahead of, of the digital um, upload and uh, getting everything you know digitized. So I, I wouldn't say we've made too many changes. I can't say there's one particular thing that we've uh, we've done different. How do you like to give back? Uh, how do we give back? I, I, you know, we set up a foundation, the Farmfolio Foundation, which actually supports communities around our projects um, last year. Um, you know, we're a big believer in, in order, if you can, if you can teach a person to fish, they can eat for a lifetime. And, uh, you know, that's kind of one of my mantras with what we're doing with the foundation is we're developing projects that become business engines for rural areas. And, you know, it creates jobs, it creates stability, and we're developing essential things around like water supply. Uh, as well as uh, we've got a program where we're putting installing water filters for uh, there's a, a village near us I would say it's a village it's more of a town but uh, there's about 1300 people in it that have had problems with their water supply and we're doing supplemental things around that around our projects to help those communities who actually work at our projects and um, and working on trying to bring some healthcare facilities in those regions as well because we are remote in most of these places and there's not as much access to um, you know, medical services and, uh, you know, things that, that we all kind of take for granted. So um, I think um, I think that's really our, been our focus of giving back and we want to continue to, to develop that and, and we're going to be rolling out some new things on that in the next six to 12 months with some new initiatives as well. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Dax. I enjoyed our discussion today. How Likewise. can my listeners, how can my listeners reach out to you? Yeah, you can catch us at farmfolio.net. Um, you can reach out to us on the website, uh, get information on the projects and subscribe to our newsletter, which we have regular updates going out every week on projects. And, um, or you can email 
myself, if you have any questions for me, Dax at farmfolio.net. Happy to jump in or connect with me on LinkedIn, Dax Cook. Perfect. I don't think that we have anything else to cover. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Alpesh. Great to be with you and everybody. Best yes. of luck. Stay safe, brother.